And this comes from Ephesians chapter 2. We have dead men walking. We have zombies, people who are dead but are still walking. And this is what we have in the world today among whom we live. And that is what Paul is addressing. When you go back to Ephesians chapter 1, you begin to realize what a possession we have in Christ. In verse 3, we read, we are blessed with every spiritual blessing. Chapter 1, verse 4, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. In chapter 5, we have, he predestined us to be the adoption, to adoption as sons through Jesus to him, Christ to himself. We have been chosen. We now are uh, chosen before the foundation of the world. We now are sons of God. How about that? What a position is that? Furthermore, in 7, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Verse 11, also we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to his purpose. So we now have an inheritance. Furthermore, the believer in Jesus Christ, in verse 13, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit. Not only were you chosen, not only are you sons, not only are you redeemed, you have been bought, all your sins have been forgiven, but now you have an inheritance. This isn't the end. This is merely the beginning. And furthermore, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. So as a result, he prays in verse 18, I pray that your eyes of your heart might be enlightened so that you will know the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power to us believe. So then he turns to chapter 2, and we begin a new subject. And he starts out this, <clears throat> with this whole section beginning with verse 1 through 10, about the power of grace that is manifested. But in for order to understand the power of grace, we have to understand our lost condition. We have to understand how deep of a hole we are really in, how much we owe to God. We have to understand our condition. Then in verse 1, we have to understand that we are totally impotent. We are totally without power. We can do nothing of ourselves. So he starts out the phrase, and you were dead. And you is the link to the previous passages, which says, what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? How much power does it take to raise a dead man? We don't, we don't know. It's never been done other than what God did. It's never been done. Furthermore, we read to understand the greatness of his power, we have to understand the greatness of the pit in which the lost person is and which we were. No one really understands salvation completely until they understand the depth of the sin of man. And that's what he's going to explain. It's not a pretty picture, quite frankly. The power that was displayed by God is that he made us sons, we who were sons of disobedience. He turned it around. The first four verses of this chapter reveal a very, very dismal picture of humanity without Christ. It can be summarized by just saying that it is a picture of humanity who is slaves to sin and slaves to the devil. The word dead is, a, is an important word in this passage. It really is in a participle which is passive. We have all ha are continue receiving dead. You know, we're living in bodies that are dying, aren't we? The minute you're born, it's a struggle. 
to stay alive, and your body is continually possessed physically of death. And sooner and later, it's going to get us, all of us. There's only one single solitary hope, and that is the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ coming again and meeting us in the air. And then we would not have to die physically. But other than that, physical death is going to be a part <coughs> of our lives. So it is a condition, a status quo. We are being dead. And we, and we are alive physically, but we are dead to God spiritually. That's a picture of the world. There is no stronger word than death. One cannot say anything beyond saying that a man is dead. What can you say else can you say? Gone. He no longer will be as we know him in this age. The unbeliever, however, is ignorant about God, ignorant about spiritual things, and the unbeliever finds worship of the true God boring. He finds reading of the Bible boring. He finds teaching of the Bible boring. He finds being with believers in church boring. Wouldn't you say that's true? They don't care about church. Why come to a church and do what we did this morning so far? Why not go to church where you, uh, you don't have to worry about them talking about your sin, and you don't have to worry about them talking about Almighty God and His wrath? Why not to go to a church where you can have a lot of razzmatazz, and where you can have all the glitter and all the things that are going on that you can walk out and feel pretty good about yourself? That's what the world wants. And it's no wonder what churches filled with all this glitzy stuff are full. And it's no wonder that churches where they're teaching the Word of God as it's written to people as they are, it's no wonder they're not full. And it's no wonder that people don't get interested in that kind of a place. Dead people cannot have communication with God, and they have no power to bring life to themselves. They're dead. There's an old illustration, but I don't know of a better one. My first funeral, it was in Iowa, and we had a little vestibule out there, and it was in July. And they, they in Iowa would say, on a day like we had that day, it's close. And by close, they meant the weather was right here. Humidity was right here, just like it's pressing in on you. Corn was growing, you could hear it grow, but boy, it was oppressive. And a church in which we met did not have air conditioner. Had windows on each side, and they let in a lot of hot air, plus what was inside as well. And they uh, had the body out there, the deceased, was in the vestibule, and people would walk by as they walked into the funeral. And they had a netting over it. And a fly got in there, and I'm supposed to stand stand like this, you know, before, be, right by the, the coffin. And I looked over, and there's a fly inside that netting, and it got on the face of the deceased. And I was expecting a... <laughs> or a... <laughs> quick. And uh, <clears throat> that's what you would expect, wouldn't you? And then it dawned on me, what? It did. There's no communication whatever. They could not feel the fly. And that is exactly the way a non-believer, an unsaved person, an unregenerate person feels about God. There is no response toward him. There's response toward a false god, there's a response toward false religion, philosophy, culture. But when it comes to God, they are absolutely 100%. And you can't be any more than that. Dead. So who has to initiate salvation? You know the answer, don't you? But I don't hear it. What is it? God. 
He has to initiate this whole thing. And that's what chapter 1 is all about. In your trespasses and sin. The word in is it means in the sphere of your trespasses and sin. Sin is a cause of death of people, and they remain in that condition until God acts. Trespasses, the word means in our vernacular, to cross the line. Here's the line. And when you deliberately step over the line, you have trespassed. God drew the line, and we deliberately stepped over it. God said to Adam, don't eat of this tree of the knowledge and good and evil. What did he do? He ate it. He deliberately crossed the line that God had set for him. Sin is means missing the mark. It's like in classical Greek where a guy, they were shooting at a target with bows and arrow. No, the other way, bow and arrows. Arrows. Bing, you know, that kind of thing. And they were going at a target. <clears throat> and the guy missed the mark. And the other guy said, Hamartia. That's a word for sin. It's falling short of what God expects. One is crossing the line, and the other is falling short. Have any of us ever measured up to what God expects of us? Not one single solitary person here. We're all falling short. In some ways, these terms are synonymous and two sides of the same coin. These are not inadvertent mistakes. They, for they express a conscious and willful action. Oh, they're nice people. They're unbelievers, but they're very nice people. But they deliberately reject God and go the other way on their own will and desire. That's what it says here. Don't ever forget that. They may be, you know, I know some people that are not Christians that are nicer than some Christians I know. Don't you? But the non-Christian is, even though as nice as they may be, they are deliberately turning away from God in their own trespasses and their own sin. They are willfully against God's holiness, against God's righteousness, and against God's failure to obey. And when you say you have got to place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, having repented of your sin, you know what they say? I got my own way. I don't need to do that. I belong to so-and-so religion. I'm a good person. In spite of what God says, they have come to their own conclusions willfully, deliberately. Furthermore, he goes on to say in this passage, he says to us in verse 2, verse 1, and verse 2, the ruler of the world. He talks about that. In which, <clears throat> speaking of your previous life before you were saved, in the sphere of which you formerly walked according to the course of this world. It's interesting, and he calls this the word walk. The word walk is a manner of life. It's a metaphorical expression about walking around in a manner of life. Paul uses this in several ways in, in this book. Look, look at verse 10 of chapter 2. Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them, have our manner of life in it. You know, that's a loaded verse, quite frankly. If you go back and really look at that verse, it is loaded. How about 4.17, Ephesians 4.17? Ephesians 4, 17. Talking to the believers again, to the church at Ephesus, and to us. 
So this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles walk, twice it's used, in the futility of their mind. Don't walk that way anymore. Look at chapter 5, verse 2. Walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself for us, up for us as an offering and sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. We're to walk in love. Chapter 5, verse 8. For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the Lord. You have a different manner of life. Ephesians 5, 15. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise. Well, as an unbeliever, here's how we walked. According to the course of this world. The word course is the word age I own. It's, it speaks of a, a time, and it speaks of a time kind of limited. We're living in a time in the 20th century, uh, first century between 210 and 220. We could say this is a 10-year block of time. And we have certain courses during this time, fashions, way of doing things. I was thinking of this Memorial Day. My dad died in, in uh, way back there in 72. And I was driving down the road, and I thought to myself, my dad would be shocked. He grew up in this area. He'd be shocked if he were to come back, which he isn't. But if he were to come back, he'd be shocked at what's going on on the farms. He'd be shocked at some of his relatives thinking. He'd be shocked about a lot of things because times have changed. And so there's a course in which is going on right now. It is taking place. We call it culture. And our culture is putting certain pressures on us, right? And we adjust to the culture. We have to remember we are in the world, but we're not of the world. Does that make sense? Did I say that right? We're not, we're in the world, we live in the world, but that is not our home. That's not the course of our age. We follow the word. We are not to love the world. So it means uh, normally has time, especially a limited time, the control of outlook, the mentality of this present world. In Galatians 1, 4, we read, who gave himself for our sins, that he might rescue us from this present evil I own, according to the will of our God and Father. Let's not get a part of the world We're in the world, we live in the world, but let not the world press us into its mold. When the Bible uses the word age in this manner, it's always against God. You know this verse in Romans 12 too. Be not conformed to this world, age but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is and which is good and acceptable and perfect. How do you renew your mind? I'm telling you, a Bible teaching church is the only way it helps you renew your mind. You're not going to get it at the 4-H club, the Rotarians. You're not going to get it at a concert. You're not going to get it at some worldly organization. You're not going to get it from some counselors. You're going to get it only from the Word of God and people who adhere from the Word of God. This is the only source of truth that counteracts the course of this age. The word age, or the word world, how does it put it in this passage? It puts it in a course of this world. That is cosmos. The created world. So you formally walked according to the mental outlook of the created world. Word is cosmos. 
Now, here's what Jesus said about the world. He said this, do not love. He said that in another place. This is what Jesus said in John 15, 18. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. I want to tell you something about the world out there. It hates Jesus Christ, and it hates Jesus Christ's followers. That's not a passive faith, hate person. You need to realize, and I need to realize, that as we walk in this world, we're strangers. We're pilgrims. Now, isn't it interesting that you can spot somebody from another country? We uh, helped some people in the church uh, several days ago who got stranded here at the church about 9, 9, 10 o'clock here, and they're going across the country. I picked up the phone, and they called me. I picked up the phone, and I knew they were foreigners. How did I know? The accent. They talk differently. And then we came over here, Abe and I came over here to see how we could help them. And when we saw them, we immediately identified the fact that they were not Americans. By the way they dressed, by the way they talked, by their actions, we could tell they were not Americans. And I'm sure that when I've traveled overseas to Brazil or some other country, to Europe or to Israel, they could tell that I was not an Israeli, I was not a Brazilian or a Honduran. They could tell that I was not whatever country I was in, just by the mannerisms, right? Now let me ask you, can they tell you, can they say when they see you there's something different about you? Remember when uh, <clears throat> the angels came to visit Lot? And Lot had uh, been, in the, been in the city of Sodom for some time, evidently, and he was now one of the main principal leaders in, Lot, in Sodom. And so when the two angels came, he said, you can't stay here in the open. You've got to come to my house. So he practiced hospitality and took the angels into his house. Then all the men of the city, boys and men, came to Lot's house and wanted to have relationship with these two angels. That's how bad it was. And when Lot didn't want them to have any of these relationships, they said, he's a stranger. What is he doing here telling us? The Bible tells us in Peter that he was a vexed man. He was just and he lived among sinners. Didn't have much of a testimony, but he did. You know what? They know who you are. And down deep in their soul, there is a hatred for Christ for which you stand. Is that what the Bible says? You're a stranger. You ought to talk different. You ought to walk different. And you ought to act different. In 1 John 15, 17, he said, Do not love the cosmos, nor the things in the world, cosmos. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. If you love the world and all that is in it, what does John say? You don't love God. You don't like Bible teaching? You don't like being with people who know Christ, you don't love the brethren, you're not, of the, you're not of the assembly of God, not church, but just of, of uh, God's family. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life is not from the Father. It's from the world. The world is passing away, and also it's lust, but the one who does the will of God abides forever. Haven't you ever noticed what's popular today will not be popular tomorrow? 
I remember when you, as a child, when you'd go in, you could tell the people who didn't go to church when they wore ties at funerals in those days. They'd have a big wide tie with a pump killing flies picture on it or some scene of a mountain scene on their tie. And I'd be glad when ties are gone forever, quite frankly. I tell my wife, that's the worst thing. A woman must have invented that. <laughs> Where's the hottest part of my body is the neck. And I've got three or four folds in my collar, and then I've got three or four folds in his thigh. But you know, if I went to see the president, would I dress up? Well, I'm here, I'm seeing somebody else greater than the president. I represent the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. <clears throat> the unregenerate are governed mental, mentally in their outlook and the culture of the world, and they are part of the same tannic system. Look at the next line. According to the prince of the power of the air. According, that little preposition kata, means the standard of rule, cord. The commander is the ru prince, is ruler. The commander, the captain, the chief ruler, or the lord. Power refers to right to rule. Note the domain, the realm of the kingdom. The word air describes the space between heaven and earth. In other words, the kingdom of Satan. If you do not believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you belong to the kingdom of Satan. It's either or. There's no if and and, or. It is either or. Either God of heaven through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit are ruling your life, or the devil is ruling, ruling your life. Which is it? What do you want it to be? That is it. Humans think they are freeing themselves when they turn their back on the Bible and the church and they say, I'm free. I don't have to follow this. I don't have to go to church on Sunday morning. I can get drunk on Sunday night and sleep it off Sunday morning. Why would I waste a weekend spending an hour or two in a church that is boring and I'm not interested? What do you think the devil would think of that? He likes that. You know, hey, hey, you're on my side. Satan dominates the life of man and all who are under his domain. Really interesting thing that when Jesus Christ comes again, we're going to meet him where? In the air. You want to see the power of God? Christ was raised from the dead by the power of God, right? Jesus Christ ascended into heaven by the power of, of God, correct? Correct. Where is heaven? We talked about it last week, remember? It's above the stars. So you have one heaven where the clouds are. Then you have one heaven where the it's starry host. And then you have the third heaven where God lives. Where Jesus Christ physically is. In a human body. How much rocket power do you think that took? To go from earth to heaven in a, through the whole starry sky in seconds, simultaneously. Now, if you were going to go to Mars, how long would it take you to get there? By what current power we got? I don't even know, really, but I thought I heard three years. Does that sound right? Three years to get to Mars? That's a lot of boring time, I'm telling you. You better take a lot of crossword puzzles with you. And videos. And then when you get there, you may not get back. 
that right now is a one-way trip. How much power did it take to get the Lord up there? Here's what it says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 and 18, Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord where? In the air. And so shall we always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. How much power is that going to take to take millions of people out of the grave and we who are alive will join them in the air and meet the Lord in the air without a space suit. You want to talk about the power. That's what Paul said in chapter 1. I want you to know about this power. That power can turn you around from a sinner to a saint. Satan dominates the life of man and all are under his dominion. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 17 to 21, please turn to that passage, Philippians chapter 3, 17 to 21. <clears throat> Paul talks about this, about our citizenship. Where are we living? What is our status now? And Paul says, in beginning with chapter 3, verse 17, Brethren, join in following my example and Observe those who walk, there's our word again, according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk, there's our word again, of whom I have told you and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Unbelievers, enemies. You know, you have a lot of churches today where they're going through church and they're celebrating Memorial Day and it'll be pretty and they will have great songs and they'll have everything. But if they don't have the gospel, that church is an enemy of Christ and dangerous. Leads many astray. And he says, whose destruction whose God is their appetite, whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things, for our citizenship is in heaven, for which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. I like that old country song, this world is not my home, I'm just what? Passing through. And let me tell you, it goes real fast. This passing through is literally quick. I can't believe how much time has goes and how fast it goes. He says now, the next line, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedient. Been a lot of discussion about the word spirit. But the simplified, I believe it is the evil principle that is governed by the devil that is in people. They don't know it. If you would go to the guy in the coffee shop, and you know, you, say, you know what? You're run by the devil. What would he do? He would laugh. And he would say, I don't even believe in the devil. I don't believe in the devil. I do what I want to do. No, he doesn't. He's a slave to sin, and he's a slave to the devil. That's why the devil has to disguise himself, by the way. He can't just walk in here this morning in a red suit with a pitchfork and say, I'm the devil. Who would follow him? None of us. None of us would. So he comes in disguised. He comes in as a very well-dressed person. He comes in friendly. He comes in kind. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he disguises himself as a preacher of righteousness. We've got to feed the poor. We've got to be kind. We've got to be careful about global warming. The glaciers are melting. 
and you think you got a flood on the Missouri River now or Mississippi, you will be wonder when all the glaciers melt. We got to find another place to live. And we got to spend all kinds of money to get there. Don't step on a weed. That's part of you. Don't do this. We're all pantheists. God is in everywhere. Love one another. That's what he'd tell you. And all the time, he's leading you to hell. And they don't even know it. They're sons of disobedience. He is now working. That's a present participle. He is now working in the sons of disobedience. It's interesting they're called sons of disobedience. They have an inheritance. Sons have an inheritance. Sons of disobedience, what do they reap? Be not deceived, God's not mocked. For whatsoever man, what? Soweth, that shall he also reap. They're sons of disobedience, and they're reaping the results of their disobedience. <clears throat> they do not believe what God has provided. Remember, here's what Jesus said in John 48, 44. You are of your father's, the devil, and you do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he's a liar and the father of liars. I mean, that's Jesus Christ. And who is he addressing here? Pharisees, the religious leaders of his day. Why, that's not nice. That's not polite. That's not the loving thing to do. Disobedience comes from unbelief. The disobedient one is not persuaded to err nor convinced to trust in the truth. They do not believe what God has provided. It is more than just the absence of trust. It's the defiance of God's word. That's what it is. If I can convince you of one thing this morning, it would be this. Sin is not passive. Transgressions are not passive. And unbelievers are, belong to a kingdom that is not just nice and passive. It is malignant. It is cancerous. And the Bible describes it as leaven. When you put a little leaven or yeast into some dough, how long does it take that leaven? Does it just sit there? And then when you eat the bread, you say, oh, I just got the leaven. I just got the yeast. Now, I'm not a cook by any means, but I've seen us put a little yeast into something and it swells in a hurry because it permeates the whole loaf. We need to take a different look at sin. You should have gone to a church where the memorial service had been much happier than this one. <laughs> the unbeliever is not only walking according to the values of the present world, they are in step with the world, they are controlled by the world of this world, and they are defiance against God, and they enjoy it. Oh, you say, would you, like to put your, would you like to come to Christ, put, repent of your sin, and place your faith? We have a wonderful life out there. Ever heard that when you give the gospel presentation, if you trust Christ, you're going to have a wonderful life? Probably not. You're going to be suffering. All God's children have got to go through some suffering. And they will say, I'm happy with my life. Right? I, I like my life. I like what I'm doing. I don't need that kind of life. That's what they're saying in essence here. Verse 3, among them we too all formerly lived 
in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. So we were like the world, the nature of the world. Among them is an interesting word, it's a change. Among them we too formerly lived in the lust of our flesh. This is a reminder of our state without Christ prior to our salvation. We lived in the sphere of them also ourselves. We were walking is a literal translation. No matter our religious background, we were born sinners. And the previous description of sinners applied to us prior to our salvation. I grew up in a Christian home. I grew up in a home where it was never a discussion, are we going to church today or not? I don't remember ever discussing that Saturday night. I never, I never remember my mom saying, Monday, are we going to go to church next Sunday? It was a foregone conclusion. If there was church Sunday night, we were there. If there was church Wednesday night, we were there. If we had a special meeting, we were there. Quite frankly, I hated it. I hated it. I hated it so much <clears throat> that in all of my wisdom, <clears throat> I locked myself in the bathroom one Wednesday night because I didn't want to go. I'd observed there was no lock, no key to the bathroom door. And if you locked it on the inside, it was locked. And my dad would be conservative enough not to break the door down. But I found out that it didn't make any difference a key or not. My father, a German, conservative, strong guy, was in there, and I was out. And I went to church dressing for church in the back seat of our car. And we went to a church where the truth was really not preached. We all didn't like it. As much as we acquiesced as kids and children, we were rebellious, we were born. And here's the thing. <clears throat> because we're born in a Christian home, a lot of times we do not have the appreciation from the depths of the sin out of which we were saved. It's covered up by our own religiosity and sort of living the good life. Right? And we always appreciate it. I always appreciate the testimony of the guy, the guy who lived and sinned and had all this, and then he came to know Christ. And somehow I thought, I'm cheated. I didn't do any of those things. And he got to do all those fun things in the world. until I really gained a knowledge of what sin is. It is a glorious salvation is as true as a 10-year-old, 11-year-old, 12-year-old putting their faith in Christ as the worst sinner that ever lived, and that was the Apostle Paul. It took the same calling the same predestination, it took the same sealing, it took the same inheritance to save you and me as it did the Apostle Paul, right? We were in the same pit, in the same hole of sin as they were. Only God, in his providence, spared us from walking through some of the sinful acts Maybe mentally we wished we could have done, but didn't do. We walked there. We are the flesh. The word flesh here is used in the sense of the immorality. It's used of evil desires. 
It can be used positively, but in this case, it's negative. It would refer to what we call the sensuous part of our makeup. <clears throat> and furthermore, <clears throat> it's a participle saying, it says, doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind. They do what they want to do. They do what they want to do. And I think in our culture now, in this particular culture of our age, it's even more decadent than the ages before it, in some ways. They've always been bad. But you know, it says in the Bible, before the Lord comes, it'll be like it was in the days of what? Noah. How bad was it then? How bad was it then? Genesis 6, 5 says, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. <clears throat> Tell you how a man grows. Years ago, I saw a movie. <clears throat> it's about police. Pl I don't remember the name of it, something like policeman. I thought it was really funny. So the other night, <clears throat> Lee Nielsen and that group came on, you know, and everything's funny, got double entendres. So we clicked on the movie, thought, this would be a funny movie to watch. Five minutes in it, we said, we're done. We're done. We're not going to watch this junk. We don't want this a part of our life. Double entendres just make you sick. And the filth was covered up by laughter. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. You ever watch the news today? Sick. Our government can't get anything done but accuse one another. And one after another falls into immorality, and one after another is on drugs, one after another is hiding money or stealing money or doing whatever. Note the usage in Ephesians 4.18. Turn to me, turn to that passage. Ephesians 4.18. Doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind. In Ephesians 4.18, Paul says, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Why? Because of the hardness of their heart. Look at a parallel passage in Colossians. Colossians 1.21, although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil day, deeds. That's how he describes the sons of disobedience. Last line we'll consider in verse 3 is, and they were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. This concluding sentence says, by the usage of the term children indicates a closer relationship to the parent than the son. Son is free to make his own decisions, right? Depends on how old they are. He, he slowly unloose the ropes and they slowly make decisions. But what does children tell you? Children depict a personal relationship and dependence upon the parent. And in this case, in context, who's the parent? Satan. They were, you are formerly, you are, were by nature children of wrath. You are related to wrath. In essence, the unbeliever has a closer relationship to God's wrath than he has God himself. What awaits the children who are not walking with God? 
and who are children of wrath. <clears throat> the, bi the doctrine concerning the wrath of God is one of the most despised doctrine of the Bible. If there's any doctrine that the world hates, the age of this world despises, it is the doctrine of God's wrath. One of the first doctrines to go is eternal punishment. <clears throat> and they have rejected God, His Son, Jesus Christ. They will be subject to the wrath of God unless they repent. If you're here this morning and you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you will die if you don't do it and go directly to Hades, to hell. How long? Forever. Oh, you say, that's not loving. That's not loving. There's one thing that is not taught in our churches. The basic doctrine of God, his basic essence is what? Holiness. Holiness. He cannot accept people into his presence unless they are as holy as he is. Wow. Wow. I'm not that holy. I have to ride in on someone else's coattail. Someone has to give me that holiness. And when we repent of our sin and place our faith in Jesus Christ, Jesus satisfied the wrath of God. He met the holy demands that you and I could never meet. And when we believe in him, he justifies us and declares us to be holy. Now, am I that holy? I'm that holy when I'm in Christ, being in Christ this very moment. Am I that holy in my life every day? No. Don't grin. You're, you aren't either. None of us are. But he gave that to us so that the wrath of God has been met by God himself in the person of Jesus Christ. That, my friend, is salvation. You can join this church 10 times a day. We could have baptism all day long for you. We could have communion all day long for you. And it doesn't help a bit. It's a personal faith in Jesus Christ alone. And that's a grace we're going to talk about in the coming days. Let us stand for prayer. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for the clarity of your word and the power of your salvation. We thank you, Lord, for the future that we have in you. We haven't earned it, we don't merit it. We don't deserve it. And why you should pick us, we don't even know that, except you loved us. So, Father, we pray for anyone here that does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. At this morning, God, the Holy Spirit, would convict them of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and they would hear the effective call that you have. And they would respond in faith. And they would respond in repentance of the sins they have committed and the state of life they're in. And how they've been compressed into the world. And they're following a leader they don't even know. And they're slaves and they don't know it. And they're dead and they do not know it. May the Spirit bring that truth alive, we ask in Jesus' name, amen.